Hello, I'm Maria Hall Brown, and this is LA Currents. It's amazing how much state government impacts local issues, and here to tell us all about it is Assembly Member Miguel Santiago from District 53. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me on. So, what I need is a little bit of a civics lesson. How does the state government work? So there's 80 Assembly Members and 40 Senators one governor and lieutenant governor. Now here's a really interesting thing. The lieutenant governor is actually the president uh, of the Senate. And so that's why you have a Senate pro tem who actually leads the Senate, voted by their colleagues. Uh, and this was established a long time ago. So if there needed to be a tiebreaker, the lieutenant governor can come in and do a tiebreaker. Kind of like you see the vice president come in and do a tiebreaker. Never really happens, but the vice president really would be the one who votes in the, in the Senate. Uh, a little interesting fact bit right there. You're a local, right? You were born and raised in Los Angeles. That's why I feel very strong passion about this. I mean, look, today uh, we're fighting fights on all sorts of fronts. Uh, right here in our own backyard, uh, we have this huge fight on the um, most pressing issue in our lifetime, which is the issue of homelessness. Yes. Uh, I don't think there's a region in California or a space in LA where you can't walk out and see somebody living on the streets, and it's heartbreaking. It right. is absolutely heartbreaking. Uh, and today we saw the numbers uh, increase the fact that we saw a 12.7% increase in homelessness as we taped this interview, that must have come as a real blow to you. The same way that it must have to any, any resident in the city of Los Angeles or, or the county or anybody in the state. I am frustrated. I am angry. We've got to blow up the system and do things a little bit differently. Uh, the same way of doing things is not going to work. Uh, we've thrown money at this situation, uh, but I think there has to be an acknowledgement uh, that we've got to do things a little bit different. And we've seen some promising uh, ways of that. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, we saw uh, the governor, we saw local municipalities move at a neck break speed. We've never seen this sort of collaboration. And the big question before us is, you know, is it going to stop because we had a pandemic? We've now learned to do some um, things a little bit differently, and we're just going to press that that only accelerates. Despite there's been a demonstration that things can actually move quickly if there's the will and the resources, but isn't it going to get worse? I mean, isn't it going to get scarier? Oh, absolutely. But th this is why exactly we need to treat this like an emergency, because people act differently. Bureaucratic systems act differently. We need to break through all the bureaucratic systems. People used to tell us in bureaucratic systems that you couldn't do this for a year. At neck break speed, we at the state unleashed almost 1,300 trailers. At neck break speed, we sent $150 million uh, out to the state. The city of Los Angeles got about 41. At neck break speed, the city of Los Angeles and the county are working together to house uh, uh, thousands of people uh, never been seen before. So look, there's a lesson there. You want to talk about a civics lesson? Here's the lesson. Move quick, move fast. If bureaucrats get in the way, run them over. But there's a way to do this. I mean, the old same way of doing things is just not going to work. We've got antiquated laws in the book that prevent us from helping somebody who was on the streets. Uh, we've got laws that were done uh, for very good intention that we've now broken through that help us uh, to create permanent uh, supportive shelters, sorry, permanent supportive housing and shelters in place. Look, I think it's time that, that we take a look at from this pandemic and say, here's what really worked, here's what didn't work. Because at the end of the day, lives are at risk. This not, that's not just a saying, it's, it's not pandering, but literally, lives are at risk. When you leave somebody on the streets uh, to live, uh, their life rots right before them, and the people responsible are everybody who didn't do anything about it. So we've got a, an imperative to do something about it. It is unacceptable that we saw the numbers increase uh, in L.A. City at 13 percent. It is unacceptable that we saw them increase 14 percent in L.A. County, and it will be completely unacceptable uh, and borderline criminal if we don't do something about it. Homelessness is this broad umbrella. I mean, how do you think we should be dealing with this? How do you delineate how things should happen? I mean, what do you think should be the plan? What would be your plan? First off, the simplest way uh, to prevent a number of homeless increasing is to keep people in their homes. First, simple way to do it. Uh, and so we're working on, on eviction protection laws, we're working on tenants' rights laws. Uh, you're seeing now every level of government rowing in that direction, and that's a very good first step. Uh, the next way, uh, is to build the affordable housing needed. Lots of folks who are on the streets uh, for unfortunate economic cir circumstances land on the street. We know that. People don't want to be on the streets. People don't wake up in the morning and say, hey, look, I wish to, to not make my rent. I wish to be on the street. That just doesn't happen. That's a myth. What, what, what really is happening in some cases is if they were one paycheck away from being on the streets, uh, the pandemic did it. 
And when you drive by and you see tents, uh, you see people living in cars, uh, there are people trying to put their lives together, good, hardworking people who have landed on the streets. And let's be clear, there's different sorts of populations uh, of homelessness. But in this one particular uh, case, uh, the ability to build affordable housing to help them get back on their feet, uh, to give them the wraparound support services, uh, it, it is a simple, fast, effective way. Uh, but we've got to do a lot to do that, and I, I understand that. Uh, but that's one step. The other is, is those who we uh, take a look at, like chronically homeless populations who, who have been on the street for some time and, and require uh, more wraparound support services. And that's why we're very aggressive uh, in, in our policy pushes to build permanent supportive housing and emergency shelters. Uh, because permanent supportive housing, along with the wraparound support services, allows somebody uh, to sustain themselves and to live a productive life. And we see a lot of that in, in the downtown Los Angeles area and across the city of Los Angeles as it's getting built. Uh, last year, we challenged uh, the status quo and we eliminated uh, secret processes so that they would get built. Uh, and so th instead of three to five years, uh, instead of the cost, uh, it's reduced cost and it's expedited the development uh, of permanent supportive housing and emergency shelters in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, we'll continue to press for that across the state of California. Uh, and then the other is, is just focusing on the mental health care services and the substance abuse uh, that is greatly needed uh, and the, um, the multidisciplinary teams uh, that can go out into the homeless population. Because you, you've got to build trust uh, with those who are home, homeless um, and have uh, other health care issues and you've got to be able to bring them in and identify the right sort of uh, wraparound support services. We also worked on issues of decriminalizing homelessness because that, 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 that is key to it. You can't criminalize uh, a homeless population and expect to add layers and layers uh, of problems to, to this individual and expect them to succeed. Um, and, and those are just some big buckets uh, of things. Obviously we need funding and we're working for that. Uh, this year we're proposing uh, over $2 billion and it's moving rapidly through the legislature. Uh, I'm happy to acknowledge that both the Senate and the Assembly uh, have worked very hard in this budget process and, and the number is north of $2 billion. Now we go into negotiations with the governor's office, uh, hopefully um, access some of the dollars. But we've done this in the past. We did HEAP and HAP dollars, no place like home dollars, local municipalities have passed their own measures. So there's a lot we can do. I think what's key though is acknowledging and and treating it like the emergency that it is. So we move now fast without uh, bureaucratic red tape. What about landlord rights? It could be a mom and pop or it could even be a large corporation, but aren't those people entitled to the income from the property that they own? How do you justify letting someone suffer for the benefit of somebody else? Look, the federal government um, at the end of the day ha has the jurisdiction uh, over federally regulated banks, which could easily uh, press them to prevent uh, the, the requirement to, to continue to make mortgage rates. I thought that's one conversation. But, but look, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, um, and, and we've been pressed on this, you can't have more people land on the streets. You can balance the conversation, and I'm willing to have it, but when the rubber hits the road, we cannot have more people land on the streets. And if that's the priority, then we've got to get tough uh, and press for the uh, eviction prevention laws, uh, for tenants' rights laws, uh, and, and ensure that more people don't land on the streets. Look, it's a difficult conversation to have, and some people don't like it, but the bottom line is we have. Look, last year, uh, we pressed extremely hard and successful uh, to pass the first ever in the state, um, uh, it, it, uh, rent stabilization uh, bill, uh, and, and that stabilized rent for a number of years. Uh, not to exceed 5% uh, and plus CPI. And that was a huge fight in the legislature. I co-authored the bill. Mm -hmm. uh, not an easy thing to get through. Uh, this year we're, pa we're working on a number of uh, tenant protection and eviction protection uh, laws, uh, uh, but that's not gonna be enough. And we know we gotta press extremely hard, but local municipalities have also stepped up and could step up uh, to, do, to do the right thing, and ensure that, that at the end of the day, their constituents are housed. Considering all the energy, the effort, the good intent, and the interest that went in in the last year, I mean, this must be a pretty big blow, and it should also, I would imagine, be a wake-up call. Well, look, it's been a wake-up call uh, since we've had one homeless 
uh, on the street, right? I mean, this should have been a wake-up call a very long time ago, and it was to a lot of us uh, in terms of ringing the bell. You know, when I first got in the office, uh, we declared uh, and asked the assembly, and we did, to declare homelessness a state of emergency because we knew it was a state of emergency then. Uh, and, and this was back about six years ago. Uh, we still ring the bells today and tell people, look, it was a state of emergency uh, then, it's a state of emergency on steroids today, and, and we've, got to, uh, we've got to move processes. Now here's, here's that, that's the bad news, now here's the good news, right? Uh, I, th I think at least at the state level and at the local level here in this region, look, we've gotten serious about it. So we ponied up uh, efforts to, to make sure that we have the dollars for the wraparound support services and measure H, and the city did HHH to do uh, the permanent supportive housing. Last year, uh, we pressed through a very controversial but, uh, but groundbreaking bill to, exec to exempt CEQA processes to, to ensure uh, that housing was built immediately uh, when it related to emergency shelters and permanent supportive uh, housing. And the streamlining processes are now showing that you could develop this uh, in less than a year. And that's groundbreaking because before that, uh, it was taking about uh, three to four years, but but only because our constituents demanded that sort of result and, and we have the responsibility to, to push forward. Affirmative action is back on the table in Sacramento. Will this bill look different than the affirmative action that we've known in the past and, and how is it being received? Well, first off, it's not the same California that we knew 25 years ago, plain and simple. Uh, let me paint to you the, the California of 25 years ago. You had a Republican governor, uh, who pressed for ballot measures such as 187, an attack on immigrants. Uh, you, we've just stated Prop 209 that it limited affirmative action. Uh, we had ballot measures that said you couldn't speak another language in school. Uh, this is dating to the time where, uh, where civil unions were, were a tough debate uh, in the legislature. That's not the same California that we see today. Same California who has a Democratic governor, the same California who is progressive leaning, the same California who has more Democrats now than they've ever had. Uh, the California at that time had to negotiate with the Republican Party uh, to pass budget bills. The California today uh, ha has 60 or more Democrats uh, in our house. Uh, it's not the same California. Um, and the population looks different. So 25 years later, you have folks who weren't born at the time who now want an opportunity to express uh, and weigh in on the issue at the ballot. All this measure says, it's let's repeal Prop 209, but let the voters decide in November. With the pandemic, students were told to go online, but there is no such thing as broadband equanimity, and I know that that's important to you. So how is that whole issue of internet access and educational tools playing out? We're pressing extremely hard for $500 million uh, in our state budget. So we're still in negotiations over that. Uh, and I also serve on the superintendent's task force to uh, bridge the digital divide. Mm -hmm. uh, we're also pressing for telehealth dollars because that we know during this pandemic uh, has become uh, more urgent and more important. Uh, and look, even if we didn't have a pandemic, there, there's a good case for why you don't need to leave your house to get a prescription. I mean, why should you go to your doctor to get a prescription? That makes no sense. Why, why would you go to the doctor to get an insulin prescription when, you, when they know you have diabetes or, or arthritis or some of, the, some of the easier things? Sure, maybe new diagnosis, but just a regular routine? I mean, this is LA, we have traffic, that makes no sense. So we're still making for those pushes. But when it comes to uh, education, uh, we feel very strongly about it because now that folks can't, or now that children can't go to their schools, um, we want to make sure that everybody has uh, both internet conductivity and also the laptops, uh, not just from the school side, but also from the student side to be able to uh, do their education. And look, I'm a dad, uh, and, and I tried this online education. It is challenging. It would be that much harder if a student did not have an iPad or a laptop or internet to do it. We can't leave generations of children behind, particularly in communities of color, just simply because they couldn't afford it. It's up to us at the state to step up. I want to step back on this affirmative action um, issue, if you don't mind. Look, here, here, here's why we need it. We've left generations of communities of color out of the UC system, out of, con out of state contracting, uh, and out of state employment. But also women have been negatively impacted. When you take a look at um, that women in the state of California uh, earn about 80% of what their male counterparts uh, earn, it, it's a daunting number. It's actually pretty scary that we have not moved as far ahead as we should have in a California that's progressive. 
The other thing too is that if you're a woman of color, a single mother, uh, you earn about 60% uh, less than your male um, white counterpart. And what, what is lost in the issue of affirmative action is that we want to uplift a community of color, colors, but what is absolutely lost is, is that it uplifts uh, women of, uh, of all cultural and ethnic uh, backgrounds who have not uh, yet succeeded at the levels they should. And the numbers show uh, when you take a look across the board um, in, in the, in the uh, both uh, UC uh, system, in the contracting world, and uh, also in, in state uh, employment. At the Capitol, we know that a chief of staff who is a, a woman makes significantly less uh, than their male counterparts. Uh, so, so this argument uh, that things are equal today uh, just doesn't pass muster, and we know that, that voters in the state of California will recognize that. Okay, perhaps you can give me another civics lesson. As I remember, affirmative action meant employers had to take things into consideration at a higher level than they normally do. Well, it's taking affirmative action to ensure that discrimination does not happen in institutions. So, for example, if we know uh, that certain populations are not succeeding at the level that they should be uh, entering education, we can make investments uh, so that they actually can uh, succeed at those levels. And I think that's what's lost about it. When the um, Kennedy administration had put this into place, as I recall, um, they basically said that you have to take affirmative action to ensure this doesn't happen. Um, and I carried a bill similar to this uh, um, years ago as it related to housing. Mm -hmm. And it was the same thing when Lyndon B. Johnson had put it into play and said, we need to take affirmative action so the segregation does not happen in housing. Um, it, it's, it's one thing not to discriminate, but it's a whole nother to work to prevent discrimination and to build so that those uh, populations can succeed. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. There's been a lot of pessimism from the protesters about whether there's actually going to be any change. What has been the response in Sacramento and what are you seeing happening up there? Well, I'll tell you, look, we've already seen the change. Uh, many of us, including myself, ha ha had laid the groundwork uh, for the very the issue we just talked about, affirmative action. Uh, we have been talking about this for years. We've been trying to proceed with it. Um, I myself introduced Bob Bills and Ms. Weber introduced spot bills, Mr. Gibson introduced spot bills. These are conversations the legislature didn't want to have uh, years ago. And in fact, uh, Mr. Hernandez, uh, maybe a decade ago, um, introduced uh, the same bill and it didn't get a hearing in a committee. Folks who may not have been convinced in the past uh, saw the need for change and joined our efforts to make that change. A and this year, uh, bills that we saw incredibly tough before uh, may get through. Uh, in the years of past, we fought, and, and I co-authored and co-authoring now, uh, independent review on law enforcement. Uh, it has been vetoed. It has been uh, uh, stalled in committees. I expect that to get to the governor's office. Why not? The time is now. And the demonstrations across the state, I think, will help us with that. Uh, police reform. The time is now. Look, uh, a couple of years ago, we had a robust debate. Uh, I was on the committee that helped uh, push out uh, the first bill ever in the, in, in the nation to uh, redefine what police use of force was. Um, and that was a hard, hard conversation and many of us struggled to get it out of committee. Uh, I think that bill would fly out today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely. So I think we're gonna see some change. Uh, and, and I think, I think um, the first place that you take a look at was ACA 5. Uh, this bill would have had a harder time in years past. And many of us who have raised this conversation were told uh, years ago, it's not the right time. The votes won't be there. At the beginning of the year, uh, our colleagues and I who proposed this bill, people sat with us and said, you're not going to get anywhere near 54 uh, votes. I'd be surprised if you get the 40 votes. And we kept chugging. We kept pushing. Uh, we barely got it out of, uh, out of committee. And we, con we continued uh, to push. And guess what? Even a Republican went on board with us on this. Times have changed. It's not the same California we saw before. And, and what we have saw, uh, what we're seeing now, um, has had a huge impact on people. I mean, there is no doubt that you have got to be angered and pierced in the heart to see what you saw on TV, which was another African-American die at the hands of police brutality. I, I, uh, I, uh, 
shocked to my core, like I think everybody else was. Um, you were the first in your family to graduate from college. You've taken on civic duty with a passion. What, would, what advice would you offer young people who don't actually see that in their future because of um, economic status or restrictions that they have in their world? Yeah, the first thing I say when I go to um, uh, some of the um, elementary schools in my district and you know, the kids are there and they want to have fun and I kind of miss that, you know, and now during this pandemic and kind of yearn for the moment when you go, go back into these communities and talk to, the, to, to young people and there's a responsibility on my part to do so uh, because role models uh, and civic leaders have everything to do in, in the way that you change communities and, and, and I'll tell you this from experience, when, when you're a kid, uh, having that access, having exposure, uh, you know, and I, I, I tell people, you know, I, I wouldn't, I never went to a university until the day I got accepted and showed up to a university. You know, I, I never, you know, went to a community college until the day I stepped foot to enroll in a community college. Uh, but this is the experience of very many people. And, and, you know, when I talk to young people, I always say, you know, I, I want you to repeat after me and, and raise your hand as loud as you can and shout as hard as you can with everything you've got in your might. I am going to go to college. Here's why you say it, because we need to continue to echo that uh, to all our young uh, children, particularly those uh, who, who, who grow up uh, in poverty or, or those who have more challenging situations. You know, you, you walk onto an elementary schoolyard or, or you walk into a graduation and you constantly say that, you know, and then you say, you got to turn around. And if your parents are in the back, and I love this during graduations, you have to say, mom and dad, I love you, uh, uh, or whoever raised you, I love you, and I'm going to college. And then you make the parents stand up. You know, and then, but, but, you know, I think part of that is, uh, is um, you, you, you tell them the same way that I was told, uh, that you are important, and you're going to have a future, uh, and that you're cared for and you're loved. Uh, and I think those are the starting points. And, and it won't be unusual if you ever see me uh, at, at an elementary graduation. I go to a lot of these, right? Because I love this. Because you, you got to take a look at the young people and you say to them, you are going to college and you're going to make a difference. And, and we're going to invest in you. But you've got a responsibility that you will invest back in the communities uh, that, that you grew up in so that we make it a better tomorrow. Um, and we fight hard for that. Look, we fought. We, continuously fight for that. That's why we fought for free uh, um, community college. That's why we fought uh, for free CSU. That may be stalled because of the budget deficits that we have in terms of the uh, free CSU, but the free community college, we still fought and it's still in the budget and it's still the reality of the land uh, here in California. Um, but I think what you tell students um, is, is you tell them that they are important, that they are loved, and that they will make a difference in this world. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me this afternoon, Miguel. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. And that's a wrap on this LA Currents.